That being said, we erase over the hotline, pick up monthly contributor to the show, Meathead, joining us here from Amazing Ribs. Dot com, the heavily, most heavily trafficked barbecue and grilling website on the universe. Meathead, how are you, buddy? I'm good, Greg. How is the Cleveland Cavalier of Barbecue today? Absolutely fabulous. I always appreciate it. How is the... Uh, uh, oh, shit. I forgot what I was going to say. Get that big stuff out of here. How is the... Uh, is it Rip Van Winkle, the guy that falls asleep all the time? <laughs> somebody somebody in the message board said, I didn't fall asleep. I was stalled. Yes, of course you were. <laughs> now, uh, here we go. We have a lot of things to get to. More things coming in even right before showtime that we can talk about. So uh, we have a decent amount of time, a lot of things to get to. The biggest thing, and I've, I have to come clean, I've, I've for some reason in my mind, I've been calling it the stall method. This isn't a method, it's just the stall. It happens when we cook bigger cuts of meat, the pork, uh, brisket as well. So I apologize to everybody that decided to call me on the carpet and say that I've been saying the stall method. Well, excuse me, I fucked up. Sorry for being a human. <laughs> uh, it is the stall, and we'll end it at there. So we're going to be talking about that because you've done a lot of work in going in detail scientifically about what that is. Before we get into that, Meathead, you may or may not know that I'm a retail sales consultant for one of the two major wireless networks, AT&T, which is the best network to have an iPhone. You have uh, got a new iPhone yourself, a 4S. How are you finding it? Um, Well, all I have to do is speak, and it finds me. Doesn't that make you a lazier (laughs) phone person? (laughs) Actually, um, it's really quite nice. I'm very happy. It's the first iPhone I've ever had. And um, I, I got to tell you something funny. Uh, I, I've, I've lost the video contact with you, so I can't show you what's on the screen. But let me tell you what happened. Well, I can see you. You can see me. I can. Oh, okay. Well, I'll show you this. Um, <laughs> I, um, I asked the v- v- assistant, Siri yes, is Siri. her name. Yes, I know her. I asked her, um, who is Greg Rempe? Oh, I can't wait for this. No, 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 no. Now it's dialing oh, something. She's not so smart now, is she? <laughs> well, this is going to be bad. Hold <laughs> on. Let's try this again. <laughs> Who is Greg Rempe? Oh, she's got a... Th- Oh no, and she's she can't figure it out. Uh-oh. I asked her this. <laughs> I asked her this a few minutes ago, and she said, "Let me find him on the internet for you." And she she brought up a website um, uh, for Greg Wimpy. <laughs> oh no, no! I'm all man. See, it's just more <laughs> fortification that Siri is a, still a great concept than a, a working thing. All right, uh, but otherwise, you're finding the phone to be uh, okay for you? Uh, yes, I'm a lemming. I'm so far happy with it. I haven't figured out how to use it yet, though. <laughs> no, that's fine. You, you, you only figure out about 10% of the phone until you upgrade in 12 months to the iPhone 5. Uh, different story for a different day. Uh, also, I've got go to interrupt you, though. Yeah. I, before we get too far down in here, I really must apologize uh, once again for missing out uh, last week. Uh, I just uh, I just blew it, and I'm a damn fool. And uh, I uh, I was very impressed with your ad libs and your story about the dogs. And uh, that wasn't a story. Uh, that was a nightmare. <laughs> oh God! You know, I on that subject. By yes, the way, please. I was going to lead you into that. You know, <laughs> heel, Craig. Heel. Yeah. Um, I, I raise puppies for leader dogs for the blind as a hobby. I've got six of them. Uh, my sixth one is in house now. I've had five of them in the past. They're, they've all graduated and there's usually only a 50% graduation rate. I do a pretty decent job of dog training. And I got to tell you, um, your sister-in-law really needs to teach the dog off, down, and go to mat. Those are three really useful commands. Off means whatever you're jumping up on, get off of it. Down means lay down and stay there until I tell you to get up. And go to mat means if you've got a little rug or a mat in the corner, you go on your mat and you lay there until I release you. They're wonderful commands. They're easy to train and they make your dog civilized and not frighten little children. And uh, your your sister's problem was, aside from the fact she didn't know how to deal with it. The other thing is, is she needs to learn ab- about crates. Dogs, if 
properly trained with crates love them. It's not jail. It's their favorite place. It's their home. It's their special place. Crates are very nice. Or a room, uh, the bedroom. Your sister needs to do a little dog training, take an obedience class. Um, and uh, you could possibly also tell your six-year-old, stop running around with your hands waving in the air. Yeah. It just gets the dog excited. Because their mental age, a six-year-old child and a dog are about the same. So neither of them is quite in control. No. But, uh, but uh, your sister-in-law needs to do a little dog training. All right, so uh, I'll make sure that I pass this segment along to her. So uh, <laughs> I, The other I, thing that came up last week that I thought I could pitch in on is the subject of meat glue. You, um, you, were, you were asking well, about I meat thought, glue. Yeah, I thought I remember actually seeing, I don't know if it was on YouTube or if I actually saw it on national television about you know some type of substance that ended up becoming meat. Yeah, no, it's, it, meat glue is an enzyme. Um, uh, uh, that is extracted from blood. It can also be made in a in a tank, but it's usually extracted from blood, and it bonds proteins. In fact, it's involved in the coagulation of blood. It's what makes blood bond, to thicken, um, and uh, it's used to take like little bits of chicken and glue them together, and then bread them and fry them and call them. McChicken poop. <laughs> and, oh, uh, is that what it, it is? Can, it can also be used to uh, make surimi, which is a fish called pollock, which is ground up and flavored and extracted to look like. Oh no! Um, uh, it's it's faux crab meat, but it's not crab; it's fish. Pollock, meat right? Glue, the meat glue is used to do that. Oh, a lot wow. of boneless um, ham loaf, and uh, that boneless. Turkey breast that is in a perfect tube shape yeah. usually has meat glue involved. Um, some of the really um, adventurous um, uh, avant-garde chefs are using it to like glue together lobster and steak and make surf and turf steaks or something, and having some fun with that. It's a it's a it's an enzyme that acts like a glue. Um, and it's 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 used pretty widely in uh, commercial uh, and industrial food production, is it, and also in uh, avant-garde restaurants. Is it safe? I mean, you can't. Uh, can I just eat meat glue all day long? I I think so. Um, I I mean, it it it's an enzyme. It comes from blood. Um, <laughs> I mean, blood is a uh, popular uh, food in many countries, not this country, but, uh, and as we know, we've discussed this before, the red juice that comes from your steak yeah. is not blood, no, it hemoglobin. is what? It's hemoglobin. Myoglobin. Or myoglobin, I'm sorry, yes. That's myoglobin. Right. Myoglobin. If it was blood, it would be black, it would be thick, it would coagulate, um, and uh, this is thin and pink and runny, it's just a protein liquid. It's a similar in structure to blood, but it's not blood, so we should stop freaking out our teenagers and turning them into vegetarians by saying, oh, you want some blood on your steak? <laughs> juice. Just call it juice. So is meat glue something that you feel is going to be becoming more and more popular and mainstream, or is it just going to be kind of off in a niche market? I, I don't know. I, I know. I know it's used in industrial food production, and uh, right. as I said, you know, make ham loaf and turkey boneless turkey loaves, and it's used in sausage making. Uh, so it's already pretty widely used out there. It's just that you don't know about it, and uh, um, I do think that some of these um, avant-garde restaurant cooks, the uh, modern uh, techniques, uh, you know, the guys who make foam and stuff uh, on your plate and then charge you a hundred dollars for it. <laughs> They're playing with it. They're having some fun with it. Meathead Goldwyn joining us here on the show talking about meat glue, how I'm right about dogs, <laughs> and uh, Siri has uh, failed, of course. Uh, no surprise to me. Amazingribs.com <laughs> is the website. Uh, Meathead, we wanted to talk about tonight uh, one of these things that – and it's funny because as I've talked to you here you know, over the last uh, year or so that you've been coming on and doing the show – You've mentioned, you know, offhand a few times about how somebody will message you or somebody will email you in almost what is a panicked state that the pork butt or the brisket, all of a sudden the temperature is stopped and what am I going to do? Now, when I got into barbecue, let's say, I mean, maybe six, seven years ago, 
I was on uh, frequenting the uh, virtual Weber Bullet forum, uh, trying to learn everything I could about my cooker and how to make it work right and, and cook well as soon as possible. And everybody told me about the stall and that at some point you're going to get to this uh, temperature in or about this time uh, temperature time frame. And just, you know, just what that's when the magic happens. Just take mm-hmm. care, relax, go have one or seven beers or however long it's going to take. And each time it's going to be different. But it seems to have almost become either less known about or now people are, are starting to get skittish because maybe it's more of the advent of these digital readout uh, thermometers. I learned, and we're getting a little off track, I had one of those ET-73 thermometers. And I could see it ticking up every so often, uh, uh-huh. degree by degree. And somebody said, look, Rempy, you know, cool out. Just get a regular solid <laughs> dial thermometer, put it in the dome, and just relax. Because when you see those temperature swings, whether it be through the cooker or the meat, you, you want to get out there, you want to start messing around with the cooker and make adjustments. And that's when things can get crazy. Swings in temperature are natural and they're okay. It's not going to be 700 degree swings, so you're not going to burn anything. That being said, when uh, when the stall is happening now, what are you telling people prior to you doing this whole scientific thing we're about to break down? Well, most people know about the stall. A lot of the old timers who just learned to cook by throwing meat on their pit were unaware of it. They just knew that you gave your pork shoulder or your brisket 90 minutes a pound or they had a, you know, a rule of thumb and they just walked away and watched their pit and, and uh, the meat was done when it was done. Um, we're into the 21st century now and we got thermometers and it's and, and especially in the competition era I mean most competition cooks are using digital thermometers they're they're on a time schedule they've got to deliver their meat on time and I'm on a time schedule too I don't know how other people cook when it's done it's done but I've got people waiting for dinner and I try to deliver dinner on time and I don't want to deliver undercooked or unsafe food and I don't want to deliver overcooked and dry and hard food so I watch the temperatures and the first time I did a pork shoulder which was I don't know how many years ago um, uh, I did stick a thermometer in it, and man, when it, it went up to about 160 degrees, and it just stopped there, and it freaked me out. And I get emails like this, uh, comments on my website. It's like the uh, the turkey hotline, you know. I get people commenting, and I I'm I'm near my computer most of the time, and now that I have an iPhone, I can answer Can't emails get away from it. Uh, you know, rapidly, and I, sure. I try to respond, and I often respond to questions within an hour or so. Um, and people freak, and I mean, you know, it's only 170 degrees, it's been there for five hours, and the guests are arriving. What the hell do I do? Um, and uh, I, you know, I was talking with um, what's his name, uh, Sterling Ball over at Big Papa Smokers, yep. and uh, they, they're a uh, uh, internet dealer of pits, and uh, he says he gets calls like that all the time. And so the question is, is, what happens? Let me describe the stall as the user sees it in case somebody is still not sure. Um, it, it, it looks like a lazy boy if you look at a chart. Um, it, the temperature rises pretty steadily from uh, the moment you put it on the uh, pit um, until it hits somewhere between 150 and 170. And a lot of that will have to do with things like how much water you have in your pit and how accurate your thermometer is, but somewhere in that 150, 160 range, it rises pretty steadily up till then, and then it stops, and it levels out, and it just stays there for four, five, sometimes six or more hours, and then it goes back up, and it finishes cooking usually, I don't know what the, you know, the competition cooks look for, I look for around 190, and, uh, and, and, and so the question is, is, what is that? And everybody was always saying, well, that's where the magic happens. And as we learn more about the chemistry of meat, you know, it was often thought that that was the temperature at which one of three things was happening. Either the fat was rendering, melting, you know, fat melts, it's called rendering, yep. um, or the protein was denaturing. 